Welcome everyone to History Gone Wild, or part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and last time, Washington left the army. Now, we settle in with him and his new bride at Mount Vernon as he attempts to become a planner. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. Purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop and join the Patreon page. Every little bit helps, and I greatly thank you all. After taking care of military duties in Williamsburg, Washington went to the estate of Martha Custis a week and a half before the date of the wedding. The two hadn't seen one another in six months. That time could be used to plan the wedding and coordinate the transfer of property from her to him as required by Virginia law. This time would also allow Washington to get to know her children, John and Martha, known as Jackie and Patsy by friends. On January 6, 1759, in front of around 40 guests, George and Martha were wed. An Anglican priest presided over the ceremony. The couple and their guests then took part in a vast banquet of food, and then dancing commenced. It took three days before the last guest left the estate. As soon as the legislature adjourned, they would move to Mount Vernon. In the meantime, the family of four settled into a routine. While the House of Burgesses was in session, the family would live in Williamsburg at the home built by Martha's first husband. There, they would host balls and festivities for other legislators and their families, including George William Fairfax and his wife, Sally Fairfax. The junior member of the House of Burgesses mostly sat back and listened, learning about the procedure and doing as he normally did, studying the mannerisms of more experienced legislators. Accustomed to giving orders rather than discussing policy, Washington got impatient and decided to move his family to Mount Vernon amidst the legislative session. The house was smaller than it would later become, with little furnishings. Martha fixed that with her collection of furniture from her estate. Mount Vernon consisted of about 4,500 acres, somewhat divided into five farms with its own overseer's slave cabins and buildings. Washington would also need to manage Martha's land on the Pamunkey River and his stepson Jackie's land. Washington had done very little actual farming. He had focused most of his attention on the military duties and left the overseeing of his estate to others. Along with planting tobacco on his land, he would rent out his land to nine tenant families who were instructed to grow the same crop as himself. One of Washington's biographers described the process of tobacco production succinctly when he wrote, The planting process began early in the year, ideally 12 days following Christmas. At that time, seeds were planted in enriched beds, manured and covered by oak leaves, or straw to protect them from the frost. Because the odds were long against a plant's survival, the large planters sometimes set out a crop ten times as large as they could use. In May, the burgeoning young plants were transplanted into mounds that resembled molehills, each dome situated about three feet from its nearest neighbor. A week or so later, hoeing commenced, a monotonous chore, but one that each mound required every five or six days. When leaves appeared, normally about six weeks after transplanting, the plants were topped. In this operation, the top of the plant literally was pinched off, leaving five to nine leaves on the stalk. Now the plant would not flower, and the vegetation's energy was free to surge into the leaves. Thereafter, the plant grew no taller, but the leaves grew larger and heavier. For the course of the growing season, about six or eight additional weeks, tobacco farmers were required to look after both the weeding and the removal of suckers, or useless sprouts that inevitably burst out. In September, the tobacco was cut. This was perhaps the most risky step in the routine. To cut too early meant the destruction of not a fully yet ripe crop, but to wait too long was to run the risk of ruination at the hands of an early frost. Once cut, the leaves were left exposed on the ground for several hours, so they would wither and be less brittle. When ready, they were gathered and hung in a barn to be air-cured. Curing required several weeks, terminating was still another crucial decision by the planter, for the leaves that remained too moist would rot before reaching the market in Great Britain, while the leaves that had been allowed to become too dry would crumble to dust during the Atlantic Passage. Once cured, the leaves were stripped from the stalk, and workers began prizing the crop. This was the final stage, the actual layering of the leaves into large hogsheads, 48 by 30 inch barrels, that had been constructed by coopers on the plantation. When packed, each hogshead customarily weighed close to a thousand pounds. Washington's first couple of years yielded him 93,000 pounds of tobacco, but after that, it began to decline. What he couldn't come to grips with was that Mount Vernon's property just didn't have the capabilities of producing the best tobacco. <laughs> 
when he didn't realize the profit that he thought he should be getting, he blamed the British middleman. When he switched companies, he ran into the same problem, confused that his crop didn't get the same price as others. Nevertheless, the tobacco crop resulted in him going into debt. Quickly, he began to substitute his tobacco crop for wheat. Washington found his crop. He went from producing 257 bushels of wheat to 2,331 bushels of wheat in around six years, and by the 1770s, he would be getting over 6,000 bushels a year. Although he would grow tobacco on some of his other farms, Mount Vernon would turn to wheat. Quickly, through study, trial, and error, Washington created what one of his biographers called a diversified industrial village with fields of flax and hemp to create cloth by weavers hired by Washington. A flour mill allowed him to grind his own wheat and those of his neighbors for a fee. His own fishing schooner patrolled the Potomac River, fishing for herring and shad. He bred livestock like horses, sheep, hogs, oxen, and cattle, and possessed his own dairy. The orchard kept his cider press running, and he installed a still to make whiskey. Washington closely monitored his estate. He awoke at 4 a.m. every day and read, writing letters and taking care of his accounts. At 6 a.m., he joined the family for breakfast. By 7 a.m., he was riding around the estate, giving instructions to the foreman for what needed to be done that day. Most of Washington's laborers were enslaved. At the beginning of 1759, he held just over 20 slaves. By 1770, he owned 87 enslaved laborers. Sometimes he personally saw to the purchasing, and sometimes he deferred to one of his merchant friends to do the purchasing. To avoid the higher Virginia duties on imported slaves, Washington would go to the Maryland side of the Potomac to purchase his slaves. After 1772, he purchased no more slaves. The slave population on his estate naturally grew from forming families and having children. Nevertheless, he spent a lot of money acquiring that foundation of his enslaved population. His view of slavery was typical of the time. He had grown up in a society where it was ever-present. As one of his biographers wrote, he was not moved to express hatred or love or empathy for his chattel in his diary entries. They were simply business propositions, and his comments regarding these unfortunate people were recorded with about as much passion as were his remarks on wheat rust or the efficacy of a new fertilizer. From his interactions with his overseers, we learn that Washington one winter neglected to give blankets to his slaves, and the overseer had to use slave cotton to give to the pregnant women and the children to act as blankets. When slaves ran away, they were hunted down, using dogs and flogged when they were captured not unlike most plantations of the period. Aside from the enslaved, Washington hired skilled artisans, as well as bought indentured servants to work on the estate. The artisans were hired on a seasonal or yearly basis, and these skills included carpentry, bricklaying, blacksmithing, and weaving. Two of his best managers were John Alton, a man who worked for him for 30 years, and Lund Washington, a distant cousin. To go along with his successful farm adventures, Washington turned to one of his first financial investments, land. He and others invested in land between the Wabash and the Mississippi Rivers, land in West Florida, and bought a couple thousand acres of land in the Great Dismal Swamp with the intention of draining it and selling the land for a profit. However, another tract of land was on his mind. When the French and Indian War began, Governor Dinwiddie offered land bounties for men to enlist. 200,000 acres would be divided up between those enlisted men. Washington feared that since the proclamation was an inducement for men to enlist, that it wouldn't include officers. So he and other officers petitioned the new governor of Virginia for right to that land. They got it. Each officer would get 15,000 acres, while privates only got 400 acres. That land would be found in the Ohio River Valley, and that was also the land that was rumored to be the next British colony. If Washington could gain a foothold in that area, then he could make a large profit from its land sales. The land claimants chose Washington as the official surveyor of those lands. 